So if you guys don't know me, I'm Alec Holler. I'm Tony Holler's son. I'm the hurdle coach at Edwardsville High School, about an hour uh, north of here in Illinois, if you don't know where that is. Um, I've been there for 13 years. Uh, we've had a lot of success, team-wise and hurdle-wise. Um, been through lots of ups and downs and everything there, though. Um, and uh, so this presentation, uh, I named Sprint the Hurdles because um, I made the presentation kind of like about what I wish I had uh, in a hurdle coach whenever I was a hurdler because even though I had, you know, my dad was a legendary coach, the great program, I ran for a dynasty, you know, he wasn't a hurdle coach and his only assistant coach was a throws coach. And so, you know how simple my dad is if you heard him talk, you know, he tells long jumpers, just run fast and jump high, you'll be fine. You know, he told me, like, I don't know, learn the hurdles, you'll be fine. Which was great for my development as, you know, getting hurdle knowledge and I really um, benefit from that today as a hurdle coach. But if you've ever hurdled before, um, you probably know how frustrating it can be when you've got some issues going on and you don't quite know how to pinpoint what is going on and why uh, it doesn't feel right. And uh, that's really the main reason why I became a hurdle coach. You know, a lot of times people become coaches because of positive experiences in their athletic career. And I had a lot. You know, I loved you know, running for my dad. It was a great experience. But actually, um, my main motivation was like, how awesome would it be for me to become the guy that I wish I had in high school? And so hopefully this presentation will give you the tools to be what, you know, every hurdler, I think, needs, whether you have experience or not in the hurdles. Most hurdle coaches don't. It's just something that they learn to kind of fill a need on your coaching staff. And I think hopefully I can simplify things enough today to give you the tools to do so and kind of know what to look for and, you know, how to be there for your hurdler, really. So um, I kind of broke this down into, here we go. Kind of broke this presentation down into just a couple philosophical things. I know we've talked a lot of big picture stuff with Coach O'Malley and my dad about um, Feed the Cats philosophies and stuff. And of course, I follow the Feed the Cats philosophy extensively with the hurdles. We'll talk a little bit about how to incorporate that into hurdle training because it can be a little bit difficult at times. Um, and then it'll be more technical later in the presentation, more about, you know, uh, the technique of hurdling and things like that, which is my favorite thing to talk about. So, um, I think the most important thing uh, for especially a new hurdle coach is to know like what exactly your role is as a hurdle coach. Um, you know, what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis to be a good hurdle coach? And the first thing is to build confidence. And the most important thing I think to build confidence is to not overcoach. Because it's easy to find, you know, like this is how your arm should be, this is how your trail leg should look, this is how your this and that. And I'm going to go over all that stuff today. And after today, you might say, like, wow, my hurdler has a lot of these things that they're doing wrong. I need to fix all of them. And you might need to, but there are also some things where you can kind of like, as long as it's like not affecting their race, maybe like leave it alone. Um, and not nitpick your hurdler into making them think that something is wrong because I think confident hurdlers are fast hurdlers. Um, now, on the flip side of that is um, the diagnosis of the problem. And I think, I don't know who it was, I think it was um, Coach CC. he was talking about um, when your athletes feel like something's wrong and they want to come to you and, and you know, ask you what's going on, what are you seeing, you know, that's obviously when you want to step in and help them say like, here's what I'm seeing and here's what we can do to fix it. Um, and the biggest thing is when you're diagnosing those problems is determining what the effect is and what the cause is. Usually you're going to see the effect of, you know, what happens after the cause. So for example, if, you know, somebody is struggling at the end of a 110 hurdle race, you know, now, what's the cause of that? Is it the cause that they're out of shape, or is the cause that they're losing momentum over the hurdle due to technique issues? And then finding those technique issues. And the best way, I think, to do that is to um, use video evidence. I, I videotape every single rep in my hurdle practices. Um, I don't usually keep uh, a lot of those videos after practice. I'll probably just delete them just to keep 
space on my iPhone. I just use the normal camera app. I used to use Little Technique because you could go frame by frame and actually get some FAT timing on reps from you know start to touchdown and things like that. But that app kind of I think it got deleted or something. Um, but so now I just use like the slow mo video or the normal video app on the iPhone. It all works. Um, and then uh, one of my main don'ts, if maybe the only don't, um, when I talk to hurdle coaches is don't get too dependent on drills and beware of most of it. Because hurdling is kind of a violent act, right? There's a lot of moving parts and the landing off of a hurdle can take a big toll on the body of a hurdler. Um, hurdlers tend to pile up injuries pretty quick if you give them too much volume and the volume tends to come from drills. Um, in college, I ran for a kind of prestigious but high volume program and it was the first time I actually had a hurdle coach. I was really excited until I learned that we were going to do a two mile warm up jog before practice and then after that we were going to run 96 hurdles as part of our warm up. And then we're going to have hurdle practice. We literally did like 12 sets of eight hurdles as part of our um, warm up. And it didn't take too long for me to develop shin splints and then soft tissue injuries and things like that. So um, I've never been a fan of drills, mainly because I think you can get everything you need as far as you know, fixing form and technique through low impact drills that I'll talk about later and just doing high speed, full speed, uh, max effort reps. Um, and then you're going to need to find the minimum effective dose, which is a big uh, feed the cats term, minimum effective dose, which is if you went to my dad's presentation last night when he talks about the uh, point of diminishing return, um, you know, what's the least amount that you need, you know, before you start getting that point of diminishing return. And a lot of that's going to come from trial and error. You have to, like they talked about last night, feel uncomfortable with how little you're doing at times. And with me, it was definitely, I got helped finding that minimum effective dose when I was coaching hurdlers that, you know, had some injuries they were trying to just work through, trying to get through the end of the season. I had a hurdler pull his hamstring in late April, and we were just trying to get him to the state meet, and we basically uh, had him jump over just his trail leg within the 300 hurdles, and we only practiced hurdles like three times, and did one hurdle per rep, and only three reps in the day. So it was, you know, through that necessity, I was able to find that minimum effective dose, and hopefully you guys can find that without the necessity part. Um, and then lastly, facilitate success. I'm going to talk about things you can do within a practice to, you know, fix a hurdler's issues when they can't fix it themselves after just telling them, hey, you're doing this, you need to do that. It's sometimes hard to put that into action, and you might need to do something to facil facilitate that growth. So um, I came up with a set of rules. Um, first one, first two, actually kind of goes together. We always spike up and we always go max effort in practice. Um, any, any hurdle practice, we are doing at least three full speed reps um, <coughs> over hurdles. And then um, the two hurdle rule is something that I kind of came up with um, when determining you know, how many hurdles are we going to jump over today and how many reps of that are we going to do. Um, trying to justify why we would do, ever do three or four hurdles in a rep. I'm like, well, why can't we just do two? Because there's nothing that you're getting in the third hurdle or fourth hurdle that you can't work on at least in the second hurdle, right? So I want to work the approach to the first and in between the first and second. And really that encompasses everything you need. And it's a little uncomfortable, especially when you have a hurdler that's like struggling the three step at the end, or maybe they're getting beat at the end of the race because it's like, I need to get them to be able to do that for longer, longer periods of time. And I promise you that's not the issue. The issue is happening with their technique, and we're going to see that here later. Um, and then my last rule is we always discount. Um, I coached the state record holder in Illinois um, in the 110s. He went 1359. He was just amazing. Um, and in an interview with Miles Split, they asked him, like, what do you do in practice? You know, what do you attribute all this success to? And he's like, well, uh, I never jumped race height and I never hurdle race distance in practice. And everyone's like, what? You know, everyone thought that was crazy. And um, it's not as crazy as it sounds. And um, we'll talk about that here in a minute as well. So, first of all, more about the two hurdle rule. 
So uh, correct form creates momentum and strong finishes. So the, that's probably the number one question I get from hurdle coaches is why is my hurdler dying at the end of the race, whether that's 110s or 300s. And first of all, anybody on a track team that's dying at the end of the 110s is not not in shape enough to finish a 110 meter race, right? Um, that's not the issue. And actually the same is true for the 300s for the most part. You might have a little bit of die out, but any getting in shape or conditioning work, I, you know, sprint endurance work, lactate work that you get from coaching sprinters, that's enough for hurdlers. You don't need to do any extra conditioning work to finish the 110s or the 300s, surprisingly. Um, a poor finish is that effect that we talked about. The cause is the loss of momentum through improper technique, spacing from takeoff, things like that, that again, I'm gonna talk about in the latter half of this presentation when we go over um, technique. So the cause happens or can be fixed within the first two hurdles. That's really the definition of the two hurdles. So if you have a problem over hurdle number six, that's not a hurdle number six problem, that's just a general technique problem that can be worked on with two hurdles in a practice rep. And now you're gonna get much higher quality within those reps and you're gonna get higher quality in the next rep too because you're not gonna be dead. You know, you're gonna be, even with a five minute um, recovery between reps, if you're doing five, six hurdles in a rep, it's gonna be hard to repl replicate um, good performance at the next one. So a little more about discounting. Um, if you don't know about discounting, it's basically defined by shortening the height and or shortening the distance of the hurdles. Um, and we never do race height, we never do race distance. And I do talk in absolutes when it's not quite absolute because like I said, building confidence is my first priority. And I have had a lot of hurdlers that were like, not quite sold on my philosophies and coaching techniques and stuff like that. And they were like, coach, can I please just go over a race height hurdle, you know, before I get to the first meet. I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna, you know, say my way or the highway or anything like that. I'll, I want you to have confidence, but then I'll cringe because they'll go and then they'll sky over it and their form will totally change. So I would rather form habits at the height that they can have success. That's that facilitating success thing. And then usually when the hurdlers buy in and they get to a meet, there's really no difference because they've you know, form those habits at the lower notches and shorter distance. And you can discount for uh, many different things. For one, I think anytime you're introducing somebody to the hurdles for the first time, you should go as low and as close as you can to start. Um, just get them used to taking off, jumping off one foot, landing on one foot is very difficult for, you know, a first timer. Um, and then you can adjust and lengthen the hurdles and raise the hurdles up like, I will do mini hurdles, you know, six inch mini hurdles to start where I know that there's really no issue getting over the, that height, um, but I don't want the hurdler to worry about the height of what they're doing. I want them to get their takeoff and landing right. I want them to get their steps right um, first and foremost. And then we'll graduate them to the lowest notch and then raise them up. Yeah. Do you discount for the 110s and the 300s as well? I was going to say that, but no, I don't do 300s, and I'm going to explain why in like three slides. Okay. Um, so uh, other reasons why to discount or how much you would discount would be the weather. Like if it's like borderline, I shouldn't even be outside today. It's so freaking cold and terrible. Maybe I'll discount a little bit more. So that's part of the facilitating success thing. Um, how many of you guys were hurdlers? at one point. Okay, so some of us, and you guys can maybe attest to this too, there's something about hurdling that I've never felt before in any, I played three sports in high school, four sports in middle school. Um, there's nothing like hurdling in practice because it always feels slower. Mm -hmm. If you put race height, race distance in practice, you can take my state record holder and he will look as slow as me. I'm like, ooh, I don't like the look of that. You know? <laughs> so that's why I discount, you know, just to make them feel that race pace, performance pace that I, you know, I want them to build habits on. Um, and then you know, stuff like daily focus, you know, and I think the focus can be different for each individual, somebody learning the cut step for the first time, or someone 
just working on being more aggressive. I might shorten the discount even more. Somebody that's more about just you know maintaining and developing you know consistency, I might keep it a little closer to race distance. Um, and so it's just about you know adjusting for each hurdler based on what they need. So here, here's the next slide. Um, so long hurdles. Um, this is my only slide on coaching the 300 hurdles or intermediate hurdles. I know Iowa does 400 meter in intermediate hurdles. Um, when I practice that, my goal is to only perfect steps. Um, it's not for endurance purposes, because they're already getting their sprint endurance from their lactate work as sprinters. So my hurdlers do sprint workouts just like the other sprinters. And then on like light hurdle or light sprint days, that's when I take my hurdlers over and we do hurdle practice. So it's not anything like extra work. I want to be mindful of that. This it's hard to be short and sweet with working in immediate hurdle, hurdles because two hurdles is like, what is it, 70 meters? You know, so if we're doing four or five reps of that, that can get you know pretty high volume pretty fast. So um, all I want to do is make sure their steps are good and we'll be done. And um, I stick to that two hurdle rule. It doesn't mean I always work two hurdles. It's just like maximum of two hurdles. You can always work anything you need to work within those two. But sometimes I want to just work on the first hurdle because the first hurdle in both races, I think, is by far the most important thing. If you get the first hurdle right, more than likely the second hurdle will be right. If you get the first two right, it just it's a domino effect. So you'll see it with your hurdler in the long hurdles. If the first hurdle steps are good, the second hurdle steps are good, I promise you they won't die at the end and they won't stutter on the curve. It's just that they have the momentum to keep their steps right. Um, and then we never discount on the 300s just because um, in the 110s your steps are pretty set. If I move the, the hurdle by you know one baby step or two feet, whatever, um, you know, in the 110s you can adjust within your normal amount of steps, right? Whereas if I mess with the hurdle distance too much in the 300s, that might affect how many steps you take in between, and I don't want to mess with that. I want you to practice the amount of steps that you would always take in the 300s. Um, and then, you know, third notch for boys or lowest notch for girls, um, I, don't, I don't need to discount the height either. Um, I do avoid switching legs, which is kind of a controversial take. Um, I'm not against it, though. If somebody can switch legs, I think that's a great tool. Um, I always say, like, hey, if you can and you're feeling the other one coming up, then use it. That's fine. I just don't want to teach someone to use their off leg because to me that doubles the amount of reps you need to do. And I don't want to add that double the amount of pounding. And I think there's a way around it. You know, kind of like we've talked about in other presentations today. Um, you know, it might be the best thing to switch legs, but you can get away without it. Um, for example, in between the hurdles to not switch, you need to do an odd amount of steps. And I've never had a hurdler that I could not get to 13, 15, or 17 steps in between. That's for boys. Might be a little bit more for girls. Um, I've had a lot of elite hurdlers that were faster than 15 steps that were like, they really had to either push it to get to 13 or dial it back to keep it at 15 steps. And what I found was either one works, because if they went 13, they were really buzzing for the next hurdle. Um, and it, you know, the momentum gained really helps them. Or if they have to go 15 steps to the second hurdle, they have a lot more energy left to finish the race, and they're able to turn it over just a little bit faster. Either way works. But like I said, if they're a natural switcher, that's fine. If they come to me with experience switching, you know, go ahead and throw whatever leg up works. Um, so like I said, the most um, asked question that I get is why is my hurdler dying at the end of the race? And it's mostly asking about the 300 hurdles. You know, I swear to God, I do 10 hundred meter or 10, 400 meter repeats every Monday. Why is my hurdler on Friday, you know, slowing down at the end of the 300? And I'm like, well, it's because they're losing momentum by stuttering, stopping, jumping, landing, restarting. I mean, that takes a lot out of you. It's not that they're not in shape, it's that they're losing momentum over every hurdle. And it's just a technique thing that they can fix. 300 hurdle workout would look like for me. Um, this is an athlete that came to me from the Peoria area. Um, he was like a 43 flat guy going 
I think 26 steps to the first hurdle and 17 to the second. In two practices with him, I was able to get him to go um, 22 steps to the first and 15 to the second. It was just all about, you know, really pushing out of the blocks. I think it's really important in 300 hurdles to go as close to full speed as you can to the first hurdle, but maybe a little bit longer strides than a you know 100 meter dash full speed would look like, and then. To the second hurdle, it just kind of depends. You know, um, I would like them to be 15 steps. You know, if you're going to have 40 flat, 41 flat, or better aspirations, you probably need to be 15 steps in between each hurdle. Um, and some people, that's kind of a stretch to do, and you really have to be um, efficient with your stride length and everything. And some people are so fast that they kind of have to dial it back and kind of I say float um, to the second hurdle like you would in the back stretch of a 400. And that seems to work out pretty well to get that timing down. So all of my, my 300 hurdle practices are, they're just getting that rhythm down to the first and the second, and also kind of adjusting for the wind, right? So uh, the day before a meet might be 30 mile an hour winds at our backs, the day of the meet might be 30 mile an hour winds at our front, right? And so how do we adjust for that? We practice both, um, and then we always have a plan like, all right, Tomorrow's wind is going to be totally different than today's, so we got to be ready to switch our feet in the blocks to add one step because the wind's going to be in our face. So if we're, you know, 22 steps to the first hurdle with our right leg up in the blocks, tomorrow with the wind in our face, we're going to switch our feet and be left leg up in the blocks. And we always practice that the day of the meet as well, just to make sure that that does work out. Um, sometimes we've made that switch and be like, no, we're fine. We should just let's just go back. And so. It's important, I think, the day of the meet to get this, um, the first hurdle steps down. As Coach, well as, I'm sorry. Yeah, go so ahead. you have um, 22 and 15, kind of your, your your target for your guys. What's your ballpark for your girls? Yeah, um, and it's not all guys 22, 15, right. but most yeah, of them they're like pretty good. Okay. Um, but yeah, for girls, um, what I've seen, the good ones are more like um, 26 and 17. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yep. All right, so now the technique portion of my presentation. This is how I break it down. Um, the aspects of the hurdles that I coach, the start and the approach is the most important because without getting that right, your takeoff is going to be wrong, and then your lead leg is going to be wrong, and it's just a chain reaction. Um, and then I should have put the arms last because the arms are the uh, most overcoached thing, in my opinion, um, by most hurdle coaches, and it's the thing that I coach the least. Um, as a hurdle coach. Clicker sucks. Um, all right, so first of all, for the start and the approach, um, I want them to be long and strong on their first two steps. It's a um, condensed acceleration phase with the hurdles because I think you need to get your eyes up and on the first hurdle after two steps. Um, for somebody that is not quite as strong or fast, um, and does not take as long as strides, maybe they can keep their eyes down for longer than that, but usually those people that are not good at accelerating, they're not, you know, in the right angles anyway, they might as well just go ahead and get tall and start running in the first place. So I think eyes on the hurdle after two steps is a good rule of thumb. And then I want the eight steps as ideal to the first hurdle um, for boys and girls, middle school and high school. And I want them to think that each step is going to get shorter throughout those eight. Now, if you look at actual distance covered, it's not longest step first and shortest step last, but it feels that way. I want them to really feel projection on the first two steps at least, and more projection on the third step than they do on the fourth step. And as they kind of get tall, I want them to kind of feel like they're almost chopping their steps, even though you know, if you actually measure it out, it wouldn't actually be that way. Um, by the way, a good Twitter follow, uh, one of the most, the best hurdle coaches I've seen is Chris Parno. He actually just tweeted the exact measurements that boys and girls should be to the first hurdle. Um, I'm not quite sold that it can be that exact, you know, but it can be, you can literally put little tape measurements out for each one of those measurements and somebody can be give or take, you know, a few inches within those steps and, you know, that can be a good way to monitor it with video. So. Um, and then I want you to get tall after your first 
two steps as well. So as soon as you get those eyes on the hurdle, I want you to get tall. Hurdlers tend to want to like hunch on their approach to the first hurdle, especially for some reason. You want to get them tall. You want to raise the hips, raise the rib cage, and look down on the hurdle. It'll be a much more attacking body position. So here's Nathan, um, my uh, hurdler I've private trained for the last like seven years. This kid had just the world's worst luck. In his junior year, he was really putting it together. He had just learned to three-step. He was not the fastest guy, but we got his form pretty good. Um, and he was always a four-stepper, middle school, all the way through freshman, sophomore year and everything. He had never three-stepped a race until sectionals his junior year. And he was ranked third going in, got to be top two to make state in Illinois or hit qualifying time. He wasn't going to hit qualifying time, but he was in first after um, eight hurdles, just blowing them away. At least five meter lead by over second and third place. And he got a little bit unconfident going into the ninth hurdle, and he just stuck that fourth step in there at the last second, had to jump straight up, barely nipped the hurdle. He kind of five steps and then falls over the 10th hurdle, crawls over the finish line, and still almost got second qualified. This year, he wins by far, perfect race, best race of his life, his senior year. Oh my God, we did it, he made a state. The uh, FAT system didn't work. So they made him come back, run the race again in 10 minutes, knowing nobody's gonna hit qualifying time. And um, this time, he was neck and neck with the second place guy, the first place guy way, way out in front of him. It would have been a huge upset, you know, winning that first race. And uh, the guy he was neck and neck with, or no, the guy winning hit his hurdle into Nathan's lane. And he had to jump an extra hurdle, and so he gets third. And so that first place guy should have been disqualified, making him third place a qualifier, right? Well, it was a rules misinterpretation by the referee. They made Nathan run it over again a third time solo. Oh. Oh and he was .02 away from state qualifying, solo. Wow. And we called the IHSA, tried to get it fixed, and they're like, sorry, it was just misinterpretation of the rule. But since he ran again, we can't get it to him. So, But um, the point of the video, though, is he was just really good at, I think you can kind of hear the cadence at least going long to short, right? It's boom, 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 on all of his strides. And it really, you can see the momentum gliding through the hurdle. So here's a slow motion view of a good acceleration. This is uh, Connor Artman. He went to Notre Dame. He was the one, I think he was third place. He was like a 24 foot long jumper. But you can really see he had a great push. And now he's getting tall. And look how short he's getting. And in between the hurdle, I mean, he was a guy that would reach. I know I'm breaking my two hurdle rule here, but this was at least, uh, this was preseason. It was in the winter. Um, but yeah, great acceleration, long, 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 and I feel like he's getting shorter with each stride, and he had a great takeoff step landing. And it just gains momentum throughout to get that right. So that leads to the most important but the most frustrating thing to coach in the hurdles. Because you can tell somebody to cut step all day, their whole life, and they might not get it. And that's one of those things where you might have to adjust your discount to kind of force it out of them. Basically, a cut step is your plant step being the opposite of a long jump or a high jump step. So has anybody coached long jump or a high jump before? A few of us. So, what do you teach long jump and high jump? Loud plant step out in front, right? You're transferring momentum from this way to this way, right? So you get a lot of speed in your high jump and you, boom, slam the heel down and get it out in front and that's going to project you upward, which is the opposite of what we want in the hurdles, right? We want to transfer vertical force, which is sprinting, to horizontal momentum over the, in the air over the hurdle where we don't have our hurdlers feeling like they're floating. That's the worst feeling in the world. And it's all because you're not getting a cut step. So cut step is basically, instead of heel first, foot out in front, it is actually 
you're swinging low, not getting any knee drive out in front like you would in a normal you know, sprint step. You'll swing it low and pull it back. And so the foot will contact under the hip or as close to under the hip as possible with no heel touching the ground. And if you do that right with the right distance to the hurdle, I mean, you are just shot out of the cannon through that hurdle. And if you can do that for a whole hurdle race, that's how huge PRs happen. Um, my 1359 state record holder, as a sophomore, his PR going into sectionals was 1488. No, that was going into conference. And he kind of figured out the cut step the week of conference. He goes 1452. At sectionals and prelims, he goes 1420. I'm like, oh my God, he might keep up with William Session, the double East absolute monster um, in the finals. But I'm like, oh, I hope he doesn't blow up and Session kicks his ass. And so he goes from 1488 to 15, 1452 to 1420, and then he goes 1398 in sectional finals. And Session also went 1398, but beat him by a thousandth of a second, and that was an awesome race. Um, but you can see those huge PRs once this gets figured out. It's just kind of like an epiphany. Once they get it, they kind of get it. Once in a while, they'll get it like once, and it goes away. But once they get it consistently, man, the PRs just come like crazy. So um, again, it's no knee drive. You swing the foot low, and then you pull it under. So it lands underneath your hips. You want to be on the balls of your feet. And it transfers that vertical force of sprinting to horizontal momentum in the air. So here's what that looks like. Here's the 1359 guy. First a slow-mo video. It's, the cut step is the eighth step. Seven, see so yeah, how it swings low, and then boom. It's like a pogo stick right underneath his hips. Boom. So you can kind of see the cut step on both hurdles there. Wish I could pause it exactly at the right time, but I'll show you some still frames here in a second. Right, boom, pogo. And you can see it again, lane one, two, swing low, boom. And you see no heels on the ground. So uh, that's a big cue for me. I don't ever say to cut step, I'll say stay off your heels. Or I'll say pull it under. You know, so those are the uh, cues that I use to try to help the kids get to that. So a picture of a cut step. So this is like a B minus cut step, especially for an elite hurdler like Travis was. Um, just a slight knee bend and the knee was out in front, but I mean this is acceptable. This is a cut step. He's got it. The foot is kind of flat. The heel, if I remove that arrow, the heel is off the ground. It could be better though, um, but this is pretty close. But this is him. This is like beginning of February as opposed to this, which is in April. You can see it's pretty much straight down. I would, again, I wouldn't say this is perfect because it could have been under him a little more and the heel could be a little bit more off the ground, but I'm not going to nitpick that, of course, right? If it felt right to him and he got the cut step, I'm not saying shit. I'm like, you got to do that two more times, go home. So, I'll contrast that with, here is uh, Connor Artman again. When he first came to me, he wasn't bad, of course. He was an you know, elite athlete and elite hurdler. But his shin angle, you can see, is coming forward. Mm -hmm. So that's going to lead to heel first. If it was just a, maybe one frame sooner, he could fix it by pulling under a little bit better. But typically, when the foot gets out in front, hurdlers will go ahead and plop it down. Right? And so we kind of got him better, where again, the knee is out in front, so it's not perfect, but it is a pretty straight line from kind of nose to heel here, and the heel is off the ground, and he gets into the right position, and he fell fast, and he was gaining momentum, so it did the job. Now here is, this is a good hurdler, but he never got the cut step down. So he was good, he was fast, he was like a 1486 hurdler, um, but he would kind of power through a bad takeoff plant step where it was out in front. He would roll over it. And a lot of times you can make it work and it looks good. 
but a lot of times it leads to a lot of hit hurdles. When you roll over a bad plant step and you, now you're going to end up leaning into the hurdle too low and so that's why you end up hitting the hurdle. It's just an unsafe position. So um, that's really the only two outcomes. Yeah. So the guy in the previous slide you said was a 24 foot long jumper. Right? Yep. So how much does that mess up his long jump approach or is that something that was pretty seamless to go back and forth between? Uh, he was a freak. Yeah. Um, and he was a coach's kid. Um, but yeah, I would not recommend jumping and hurdling mixed because of that yeah. and also because of the pounding. Right. I mean, I think jump, jumpers and jump coaches are guilty of over jumping their jumpers anyway. And then if I add hurdling to the mix, I'm like, ugh. But, man, it is very different. And I would say it would mess him up pretty bad. But, obviously, he did it pretty good. Okay. And he was a 1A guy. You know, like, he could have been like a 14 flat hurdler and he was more like a 14-6. But being 1A, you know, you're top three in the state at 14-6. All right, so the cut step will lead to a uh, takeoff position, which is now leaving the ground off of that cut step. So um, now we need to be the proper distance away from the hurdle. And again, this is give or take probably half a foot. It should be about seven feet for boys for the proper space to lean into the hurdle with the proper angle, and probably six to six and a half feet for girls. Um, since or middle schoolers because the hurdles lower um, and so what we're looking for is neutral hips it's a lot like uh, acceleration angle out of the blocks just not as extreme and again you'll see it in the picture coming up because we want triple extension at the ankle knee and hip and we want um, obviously no heel on like the cut step and then I want to get this is a big cue I use get your nose past your toes so uh, big uh, Wrong cue I hear hurdle coaches use a lot is something like fold the book or bend at the waist, basically. And I don't think you want bending at the waist. I think you want your hips forward. If you're bending at the waist, your hips are hanging back. And I want my hips leading past my takeoff foot. And that will give us hip displacement into the hurdle, which you see right here. So that same video, here's just a still frame here. He's getting maybe not quite triple extension. I would say he needs to extend that knee a little bit more, which would push his hips just a little bit farther. And I think if we're looking maybe even back farther, maybe he's not getting full extension here and hips displaced more because if he did, he might hit the hurdle, which means maybe he was too close to the hurdle on that takeoff step. So maybe he needs to back up a few inches and maybe I would need to put a piece of tape down to get him there. Or maybe I'm discounting here by six inches and he's so rhythmic that you know I shouldn't have discounted it. I would just move the hurdle back to normal distance. So that's how you can manipulate it. So here's a, the next phase of that. So it's not the same rep or race, obviously, but here his toe is still on the ground. And then here is the very next frame where the toe is totally pointed down, just like it would be pushing out of the blocks. And you can just see he's about to blow past this hurdle with a ton of momentum. And then the next phase of that would be the heel starting to come up. And a huge part of the lead leg is getting a huge split between knees here in this exact position. So this, I think, is what made him as good as he was, where stretching the knees, leading in with your lead leg, is like pulling a rubber band and then letting go. That's how you get a fast trail leg. We're going to talk about trail leg here in a minute, but that's kind of a byproduct. Fast trail leg is a byproduct of this big split right here. These guys are all great hurdlers. He hurdled at Iowa, he hurdled at Minnesota, he hurdled at Nebraska. Um, and they're all kind of at different phases of their takeoff. I could critique them all day, like, this is pretty decent cut step. He's just loading too much. You want to pogo off the ground and not bend the knee. He is about to cut step, I think, if he pulls this under and pushes the hips forward just a little bit. By the time he lands, I think he'll be in a good cut step position to really project into the hurdle. So here it is at full speed. So 
was, this is one of those videos where like the longer you watch it, the more like it really feels like he's jumping out of the screen and just really projecting. And we've all seen those hurdlers that is just like straight up and then straight down. The only difference is his foot placement on takeoff. That's what made him who he was. You know, he can never break 11 in the 100, but he you know, looks like the fastest kid alive. All right, so proper takeoff position um, leads me to the next aspect that I coach, which is, which is the lead leg, which we want to lead with a bent knee, not a leg swing. That's a common misconception for especially young hurdlers. Um, they, they see the extension past the hurdle, so they think you need to swing your leg up straight. And we know that we need to bit, lead with a bent knee, and then that extension will naturally happen. So you don't consciously extend your lead leg, lead with it bent, and it'll kind of extend on its own as your chair leg comes off the ground. It'll just naturally go. Um, and then like I said before, we want to create that stretch, the big split between your knees, and then keep that neutral hip to where your hips are not lagging behind. We never in any sprint, you can correct me if I'm wrong, any event in track and field do we want our hips back. We want them constantly projected forward, at least in line with your body. Um, and then the maximum extension should happen before the hurdle, the, that extension of the lead leg. So here is that really good hard lean. So two really good hurdlers here is my hurdler in the white and orange. Um, just a real aggressive, high bent knee drive. And it might look like, man, they're, they're not going to get extension before that hurdle, but they do. So here, here, here it is. And you can still see that huge split. That trailing is still trailing. One of the most common issues I've seen with youth hurdlers, um, I've been doing some private training sessions with a lot of young kids lately, and they are in a rush to get that trail leg through because they want to get that in front and help brace them on that landing. They want to kind of almost do a two-footed landing and they want to rush that trail leg, so that's something to watch out for. Um, so here's my favorite picture of that big split with how high this knee is and how far back this one is. I mean, that trail leg is ready to whip through. And he's kind of a tight Hurdler, he wasn't quite as flexible as Travis is, so he never got full extension, and that's okay. You don't have to have that gymnast flexibility like Travis does. That's not what made him who he was. I've seen plenty of good hurdlers that are really tight rubber bands. But here's a good angle of Travis getting that good extension. One thing about Travis is he was a low rep hurdler, and some of you may know what that means, some of you may not. Um, what I mean by that is every single rep of his looked the exact same. So why make him do all these reps, right? So I'm like, if you give me three reps that look the exact same and they're all perfect, I can't complain about them, then you're done, go home. You know, Some people are more high rep guys than those are the ones that usually they lack confidence. Um, and those are the ones where you have to be like, no, I know you feel good right now, but if you keep this up in a week, you're going to be, you know, complaining about shin splints. Your hamstring's going to be tight. And you can't run in the meat, stuff like that. So um, you got to kind of keep those high rep guys at bay as well. So now, trail leg. Um, I think there's been a lot of improper trail leg coaching. The main thing I coach with the trail leg is safety, um, so they don't hit the hurdle. So trying to get the proper position before the trail leg comes to the hurdle. Um, the trail leg speed is an effect of a good split. So the speed comes from the split we saw with the lead leg. Um, and here's my rules for it. The knee must always stay higher than the foot. There is never a time in uh, trail leg's motion that the foot should ever come higher than the knee. But it happens way more than you would think. So a lot of times, Hurdler's foot wants to kind of lead the action, and so their foot will stay down, and their, or their knee will stay down, and their foot will come up, and then now the knee's kind of stuck, right? So when my foot comes higher than the knee, my knee has a hard time getting a lot of height, but if the foot trails the knee, and the hip drives the action, like you're trying to knee somebody in the chest, 
and the foot follows, now my knee gets a lot higher and it'll come off the hurdle in a sprint ready position and it's going to be a lot safer. So then the other thing about being safe is toe up and out. So if your toe is down, you're going to hook the hurdle. If it's um, inside, obviously you're going to hook the hurdle. So I want to work on getting that toe up and out as much as possible and then heel to the butt. A lot of times I'll see hurdlers, especially my trail leg drill, they will go up like this looking good and then they'll go Ooh. try to get up and over it. And it's just a lack of flexibility. Maybe you need to lower the hurdle down one notch until they get it, you know. But it won't take that long for them to get that. Just have patience. So here's perfect trail leg position. Knee higher than the foot. Yep. Toe up and out. Yep. Looks good. Same thing, just a, maybe one frame farther. And it's, just, it's a patient trail leg too, so pay attention to where his knee is here. What would you say, like just maybe an inch past the hips at this point, where his whole body is past the hurdle, right? Every part of his body is past the hurdle, but his trail leg knee is barely past his hips. Okay, so remember that for this next picture. I only put this up because this is my dad's hurdler. So, <laughs> look at where his knee is. About the same place that my hurdler's knee was in the last slide, right? So go back. But his whole body is past the hurdle. This guy, from Plainfield North, my dad's hurdler, should have been really fast, but he had a trail leg that was in a hurry. That thing would come through before he even crossed the hurdle, right? So if this was hanging back here, like it should have been at this point of his trajectory, then it would really whip, rip through uh, a lot faster. But instead, it's kind of a dead leg coming through where it's just sitting there waiting, 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 and then it just plops down and then it starts running again. So you lose momentum with that trail leg going too fast. And that's why I don't ever tell people to pull it through. So I wanted to show this big split again. So probably the same position as this guy, right? The hips are maybe a foot behind the hurdle. But look how far, much farther back his knee is. So that's kind of the difference there. All right, arm action. Um, here's all I tell my hurdlers. Like everyone's always like, what do I do with my arms? My arms are crazy. They're pulling me everywhere. I'm like, all right, if you're running, what do you do? I'm like, I'm like this. I'm like, all right, now kick your right elbow out. Done. <laughs> all right, that's it. Don't do anything else. Try to keep them bent. Um, if I want to get more detail, don't let your fist cross the midline of your body. So as soon as you get here, you're going to get an equal and opposite reaction. I just now pulled my shoulders unsquare, and that's going to pull even harder unsquare on the way back, and that's how you get the sideways turn landing. Um, elbows out helps that, so that's why I said kick the elbow out. This one elbow out works too. That helps because that keeps my hands on their own side. Keep your hands to yourselves. Keep their hands on your own side, right? Okay, that'll help you not cross the midline. That'll help keep your shoulders square. And that's really the only function of the arms is to keep yourself square, okay? And then the elbow has to be out because on the way down, you got to get around the trail leg, okay? So otherwise, I would just say keep it normal, but you're gonna slap your own knee. You just gotta trace around your knee and now you're back to normal. That's it. So you just trace around the knee, back to normal. Right here. Alright, now, I told you my hurdlers weren't perfect. Terrible arm action, but he just went 13.59 in this race. This guy couldn't break 5 flat in the 40, he went 14.35 and got 13, or, uh, third in the state in this race. Both of his elbows are straight, they are not bent, like I told, tell them, keep your elbows bent. Nope, they didn't do it. Um, but they were riding high, feeling confident at this time. I'm not going to mess with them. That's kind of the don't overcoach thing. If, it, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But you will see this is wrong. But, you know, some people have bad running technique and run nine stuff on ready grass. So here, same picture I showed before, but you can see in practice at least, it look good, right? We have the elbows bent, staying on their own side, 
they're square. But here's that um, the state meet after the uh, his, this is his sophomore year where he was running with <coughs> this guy, Coach Donaldson's guy, um, in sectionals. But then he was getting beat at the state meet. He kind of freaked out. He hit a hurdle. He's reaching, and now his arms got real turned. The straight straightening of the arm really affected him because. Long straight arms or heavy arms, and so they're going to really pull you back and hurt your forward momentum, and that's why he's twisted so bad and his form looks bad. Luckily, he survived and got second. Next. So here it is again. Coach Donaldson, maybe he should be up here talking. His guy had perfect arm action, elbows bent, shoulders square. They're on their own side. My guy's arms wide. But still, it's, I'm telling you, it's fine. His arm should have been down here, elbow bent, but he was strong enough and smooth enough that he did not pull himself unsquare, and so I'm not going to mess with it. All right, so now the next aspect of what I teach is the landing. Um, we want to land in what we call the power position, which I'll go forward one. This is the power position. Boom, boom, both of them. So it looks like they're just... Boom, coming off of an A skip, right? Great arm action, elbows bent, the knee from proper trail leg position, the knee is up, toe is up, and we have a forward lean coming off the hurdle, and I think that leads to gaining momentum over each hurdle. You can get that every time. So going back to the landing slide, we want good posture, which basically means making sure the hips are in line. Um, that high knee, Landing under the hip, so if you land out in front, past the hurdle, that's just as bad as landing out in front, uh, taking off before the hurdle. Um, and then you want to just avoid collapse, and this is especially important for um, beginner hurdlers or youth hurdlers. It is hard. Sometimes I will just have a beginner hurdler, I'm like, you got to get used to one-legged landing, so I would have them stand on a chair and drop and stick the landing on one foot without collapsing and bending the knee because I want you to be able to stick it without requiring the tray leg to land right next to it to kind of help brace for the landing. I want the lead leg to land and push off on its own step so we're covering ground and being efficient. So um, here are the drills that I do to work those aspects of hurdling. Um, I call them my low impact hurdle drills. Everybody does some form of these. Um, but the devil's in the details with these things. Um, they can be done daily because there's zero landing and pounding. Um, they do teach technique and muscle memory, which is all we want out of drills anyway, right? I mean, and they're great because they don't take a physical toll. So here they are. Lead leg wall drills. I do three sets of eight on the third notch or one notch down. So if you're girls or middle school, just do it on the lowest notch. Um, the one thing with the lead leg wall drill is you need a wall. Um, which I don't have when we're practicing outside, so I only do this when we practice it inside, which that's okay. My favorite thing about the lead leg wall drill is basically you set a hurdle up against the wall and you walk up to it and you lean into it with a bent knee. The best part about it is you can practice feeling the cut step, pulling it underneath, not landing on our heel, not letting it land out in front, things like that. So it's almost like more of a cut step drill than anything, and you can kind of feel your hips getting projected forward into that wall, and you can practice leading that height, lead leg knee, um, and then also uh, work an arm action. Um, the trail leg fence drill, this is the one that nauseates me the most. I see in uh, track meets all the time, people are like doing this over the hurdle, just over and over again, and not even like, just like mindless, right? So I want to, I used to do this fast, um, and I like to do it slow now, that's one kind of change that I've made is I want people to go slow as possible. Really make it, your leg work, you know, strength and flexibility wise. Um, and then just use those techniques we talked about. Knee higher than the foot the whole way through. Make sure you're pulling the tray leg knee to the armpit and then knee to the chest so we get that power position before we come back down. And then one, maybe one of the most important things is this one you need a fence something to grab onto because I think the most important part of this is rocking back to where your hips are behind the hurdle and pulling forward with the fence as 
the trail leg. So your hips can lead and the trail leg can trail. And so now you're pulling it through and simulating what it's actually going to be like rather than like if this desk was the hurdle, my, my trail leg's not trailing. This is not a trail leg. You know, you got to get in front of the hurdle so the trail leg can work coming over from a trail position. And then we do walk and skip overs, four hurdles. This is another big detail for me. Lowest notch, space six feet apart. I just do six of my baby steps. Your athletes can do that as well. Um, what I see people do this as is hurdles stacked one after another, and they are not forced to cover ground and be efficient with their steps in between. I'm kind of big on that. Um, we do lead leg, trail leg, and then full over three times. So what I mean by lead leg is we will do just the lead leg going over, step, and then you only have one step to get to the next one. All right, and then the trail leg, this is a big one. You have to step past the hurdle just like the fence drill so the trail leg can trail. So I'm, if this is the hurdle, my foot's way over here, and now I'm covering ground, and I'm stepping far to get to the next hurdle to get past it to get trailing again. So again, that's uh, three each of those, and then I'll do the same thing with skips, but I won't go skip it over the middle. We do have a few minutes. I know I kind of fly through everything, don't leave a lot of room for people to ask questions. Do um, you guys have any uh, questions for me? I got a, I got a quick one. So yeah. with, um, like in the beginning, you had the, the the one boy who I think it was his junior year started three-step on the one who had the race, yeah. run the race, spin his first. So when you're training and, and, and you're discounting, and I, and I love bringing hurdles in too, yeah. are you just working with that kid on three-step and then come meet day, good luck to you, we hope it comes through, I'll right. help it didn't this one we come, or are you, how do you kind of address that, you know what I mean? Yes, yes, great question. It was very difficult and frustrating for me because I had never really worked with somebody who couldn't three-step, you know, like right. basically if you're a high school boy and I couldn't beat you to three-step, I basically just made you go to distance or something. Um, so it was de definitely different. I was working with you know middle schoolers and, and girls and you know just different skill levels and stuff when I started training private kids, um, and so that was a kind of an adjustment for me. I went from like no, you're gonna three step, we're definitely doing it, and he just he just wouldn't do it. He, he was too scared, and so he would blow up at a meet, and I had to readjust and basically be like, all right, we're gonna split up our practice. We're gonna work. I'm going to stretch you out some, try to make you cover ground a little better, um, and work three-stepping about half the time, but then especially like the day before a meet, we're going to go back to your four-stepping, so at least you know you can work what you're going to do in a meet. And then we don't always have a meet plan as well, like for about a year, he would have a great acceleration in eight-step, and then a great three-step, and then beyond that, he was too scared. And so we're like, all right, we're going to three-step the first one, and then four-step the rest of the way. And so we would practice doing that. And so, yeah, I would say 50-50, practicing what we're going to do in the meet, practicing um, three-stepping. And um, we would practice three-stepping only in the off-season. So that's usually when I worked with him the most. So didn't have that problem too often. But I did work with a couple middle schoolers this year that were kind of in between. Maybe they could three-step or not. Um, but it's great to work that in the summer. But in the season, it's you got to work what they're going to do in the meet. Yeah. Do you, do you guys ever use that free lap timing with hurdles out of the blocks, touchdown over the second? Do you, do you ever do that? Yes. And um, I basically, I used um, kind of my 1359 hurdler is like, okay, what is he doing? And he first, and then consistently under 110 to the second. And so um, whenever he was slower than that, I would have to use that and be like, okay, is something wrong with him? Does he need to quick practice for the day, or, you know, is this something where I need to discount more to make sure he's getting the proper performance that we want, or I need to manipulate it, you know, so I'll be like, all right, well, let's try a, you know, a little more of a discount, and if it's still not looking good, I'm like, all right, we're good for this, you're fine, you know, so maybe you just didn't have it that day, so I definitely use that as a tool to, like, make sure they're getting good reps, and, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then, you know, it's different for everybody, just as long as you're keeping track, like, I had like a 15-5 guy that I know was like 117 between each hurdle every time, and you know, so like I knew that was what he needed to be, and if he was a, you know ahead of that, then we're getting better, and yeah, it's great 
to you know keep track of everything. So. Well, this isn't it really a question. Absolutely, yeah. it's a very fast, meaningless story. I got suckered into doing an old guy decathlon <laughs> to buy my children. Now I'm 51 uh -huh. and I haven't done one since college, but USATF Masters was at Lindenwood. Uh -huh. My kids are like, come on, you gotta do this thing. So when you turn 50, the hurdle setting becomes the girls okay. setting. So yeah. I'm feeling this is gonna be solid, three step all day long, no <laughs> worries. I mean, my practice was my PE class, there's a hurdle, I go over, okay, I'm good. There wasn't much uh -huh. to it. Uh -huh. But obviously day two of a decathlon, you feel a little bit different, especially at age 51, you're experiencing different right. different things. And I knew right away, it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to four step, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so for five of these 10 hurdles, yeah. I had to, it, with the first day, I've never gone over with my opposite leg ever in my lifetime yeah. Yeah. Um, and my children were kind enough to video it in slow motion because everything looks you know right. humorous in slow motion and I think it took like three minutes in slow motion it took forever yeah. and I'm, I'm going and I hear these random strangers are yelling keep running keep running and in my mind I'm thinking you people I am running I'm trying am I, yeah. am I going so slow with the, the, the strangers over there they're they're yelling so it's just such a different feeling to go over with that opposite leg but definitely it is so I mean the when you haven't done it in a while the toll that it takes the landing oh. it feels like you're crumbling on every step yeah for sure <laughs> yeah for sure yeah how many days a week are you having your so uh, no more than three, and that includes meets. So like if you have two meets in a week and they're gonna hurdle in both of those meets, then I would say just practice hurdles once. Yeah, so I'm- That's, that's what I run into the most of my hurdle every day. Oh, I know. Hurdlers love hurdling. And it's like, it's a good thing to be the one that to hold them back instead of making them do it, you know? But it can be challenging. You know, wait till you're not looking and then they'll go see oh, yeah, back and exactly more. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Yep. I was just talking to them. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's just the buy-in, too. I feel like, you know, just like we're spreading the word about Feed the Cats and those philosophies and stuff like that, I think the biggest one to convince is the kids that, like, it is. you're going to be worse off if you do more. Yeah. 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 Do you normally pair it with your with lower speed days, not like X Factor days or anything like that? X Factor is typically when we do it. Yeah. So when I you hurdle sure on we, X Factor days? Is that hurdle on X Factor days, but not exclusively. You know, sometimes like if we have, um, let's say we have a Friday meet and we do uh, speed day on Monday, X Factor Tuesday, speed Wednesday, pre-meet day on Thursday, we'll do like maybe Thursday hurdles and Tuesday hurdles. Or I'm like, okay, let's get, um, we need an X Factor day, we didn't do one last week. So it's never set in stone for me, but I try to do two hurdle practices when there's only one meet and I just pick the best two days out of the week. you got a hurdle that does short and long hurdles, how often do you flip-flop? Yeah, so I only do the 300 hurdle practices on like the day before a meet and it's just a step check. Yeah, so we'll do like maybe two preseason 300 hurdle practices where we're working on those steps and it's a little bit more reps. But beyond that, it's like if your steps are good, we're done. It's almost like practicing relays like I think my dad was saying earlier. Like you get one perfect one. We're good. We're done. Get out of here. Do you discount the hurdles in the 300s? No, nope. no discount on the 300s just because I don't want to mess up steps. Yeah. In the 110s, I'm not worried about messing up steps. How do you correct steps with 300 hurdles if you have issues there? Switching between the blocks is almost the only thing I do. So do you like tape out distance between stride length or anything like that? I have it. No, I mean, I'm not against it. Um, I'm just too lazy, I think. <laughs> um, so I feel like I could just eyeball it and be like, all right, you're taking too short of strides. Right. Um, you know, you need to try to lengthen it out. Um, and then one thing I've had to mess with with my elite guys is sometimes 15 is too many steps for them, so they gotta either shorten it down or stretch it out. And so that kind of takes a little bit to figure out. I like to sh shorten it down rather than stretch it out because I don't want my guys like literally bounding toward the second hurdle, so. Do you coach the girls as well or just the guys? Just the guys. I've had some girls that I privately trained, but not like our girls team. In the 300s, is the takeoff distance a little further than 7 feet? Because you have more momentum, or is it still up? It's a good question. Um, I haven't measured that out. I've more just like eyeballed it, like, okay, your hips are not coming forward, and that's because if you were to, you were going to plow into the hurdle, you're too far away, you need to give it more space. 
Um, but I think, yeah, I think that would probably work out about the same, maybe a little farther. Yeah. What are your determiners for identifying kids that would be good hurdlers, both short question. and long? So um, the hard part is, like, a lot of my best hurdlers, I would have had no idea, mm -hmm. but my head coach, uh, is a you know great facilitator with my hurdle program and everything and he really helps me he's like everybody should go try hurdles and like literally we have like half of our freshman sprinters come try it most of them are too scared and they last about a day or two mm -hmm. and then like another half of them try it and don't quite get it but like some of them pick it up so it's basically like we try everybody and you know see who sticks with it so yeah because that's something that we run into is we don't have very many. Right. And so most of them are scared right. to try it. So how do you, because you said yeah. you're blowing them. Yes. So how, do you, how do you deal with the fact that you're going to be higher? Like if their yes. confidence is already the problem. Right. So um, just try to sell it to them, try to get buy in. And I constantly. Low. Am, with yeah. them. Well, I'll start with low and then we raise it up. Um, and I just constantly say, if I look at my track record, like nobody, none of my hurdlers ever fall. I'm great at teaching proper trail leg motion. I will never put you in a hurdle race if your trail leg's looking like this, you know. And therefore, you're never going to fall. Um, or I would never put you in if there's anything that looks like you have dangerous hurdle form. And so, uh, and I would never move you up or farther away until you're ready. And so, like, if you never get there, then you'll never run in a hurdle race. But I think you will. And so it's just constantly reassuring them, I think. So you're working on technique um, right. before they go over the hurdle? Make sure, or are they Right, yeah, so like I use, I'll use like a mini hurdle, just something there that yeah. they have to pretend to jump over. Okay. So it's more like takeoff and landing first, and then making sure their strides are good and in between and leading up to the first hurdle. Yep. The boys' hurdles can be a pretty violent race, obviously. Oh, yeah. When do you feel like a kid, like a young kid, is ready for the hundreds? Is it really the trail leg for you that you look at mostly? To, yes. To I mean, I, I, I get the safety thing. Sometimes I think I'm a little overcautious with letting right. them get in there the first time. But yeah. I am too. Yeah. Yeah. Because, right. you know, I want everyone to love the hurdles mm -hmm. and, and not be scared of it. And so I want them to be begging me. Mm -hmm. Like, please, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm like, no, nah, you look at this. Your video, your trail leg's dangerous, mm -hmm. and I don't want you to fall on your first hurdle race, you know. So, yeah, just have conversations with them.